Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. Of Mice and Men. By John Steinbeck. Chapter 1. A few miles south of Soledad, the Salinas River drops in close to the hillside bank and runs deep and green. The water is warm too, for it has slipped twinkling over the yellow sands in the sunlight before reaching the narrow pool. On one side of the river the Golden Foothill slopes curve up to the strong and rocky Gabalon Mountains, but on the valley side the water is lined with trees, willows fresh and green with every spring, carrying in their lower leaf junctures the debris of the winter's flooding, and sycamores with mottled, white, recumbent limbs and branches that arch over the pool. On the sandy bank under the trees the leaves lie deep and so crisp that a lizard makes a great skittering if he runs among them. Rabbits come out of the brush to sit on the sand in the evening, and the damp flats are covered with the night tracks of coons, and with the spread pads of dogs from the ranches, and with the split wedge tracks of deer that come to drink in the dark. There is a path through the willows and among the sycamores, a path beaten hard by boys coming down from the ranches to swim in the deep pool, and beaten hard by tramps who come wearily down from the highway in the evening to jungle up near water. In front of the low horizontal limb of a giant sycamore there is an ash pile made by many fires, the limb is worn smooth by men who have sat on it. Evening of a hot day started the little wind to moving among the leaves. The shade climbed up the hills toward the top. On the sand banks the rabbit sat as quietly as little grey sculptured stones. And then from the direction of the state highway came the sound of footsteps on crisp sycamore leaves. The rabbits hurried noiselessly for cover. A stilted heron labored up into the air and pounded down river. For a moment the place was lifeless, and then two men emerged from the path and came into the opening by the green pool. They had walked in single file down the path, and even in the open one stayed behind the other. Both were dressed in denim trousers and in denim coats with brass buttons. Both wore black, shapeless hats and both carried tight blanket rolls slung over their shoulders. The first man was small and quick, dark of face, with restless eyes and sharp, strong features. Every part of him was defined, small, strong hands, slender arms, a thin and bony nose. Behind him walked his opposite, a huge man, shapeless of face, with large, pale eyes, and wide, sloping shoulders, and he walked heavily, dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. His arms did not swing at his sides, but hung loosely. The first man stopped short in the clearing, and the follower nearly ran over him. He took off his hat and wiped the sweat band with his forefinger and snapped the moisture off. His huge companion dropped his blankets and flung himself down and drank from the surface of the green pool, drank with long gulps, snorting into the water like a horse. The small man stepped nervously beside him. Lenny, he said sharply. Lenny, for God, sakes don't drink so much. Lenny continued to snort into the pool. The small man leaned over and shook him by the shoulder. Lenny. You gonna be sick like you was last night. Lenny dipped his whole head under, hat and all, and then he sat up on the bank and his hat dripped down on his blue coat and ran down his back. That's good, he said. You drink some, George. You take a good big drink. He smiled happily. George unslung his bindle and dropped it gently on the bank. I ain't sure it's good water, he said. Looks kinda scummy. Lenny dabbled his big paw in the water and wiggled his fingers so the water arose in little splashes, rings widened across the pool to the other side and came back again. Lenny watched them go. Look, George. Look what I done. George knelt beside the pool and drank from his hand with quick scoops. Tastes all right, he admitted. Don't really seem to be running, though. You never oughta drink water when it ain't running, Lenny he said hopelessly. You'd drink out of a gutter if you was thirsty. He threw a scoop of water into his face and rubbed it about with his hand, 
under his chin and around the back of his neck. Then he replaced his hat, pushed himself back from the river, drew up his knees and embraced them. Lenny, who had been watching, imitated George exactly. He pushed himself back, drew up his knees, embraced them, looked over to George to see whether he had it just right. He pulled his hat down a little more over his eyes, the way George's hat was. George stared morosely at the water. The rims of his eyes were red with sun glare. He said angrily, we could just as well have rode clear to the ranch if that bastard bus driver knew what he was talking about. Jess a little stretch down the highway, he says. Jess a little stretch. God damn near four miles, that's what it was. Didn't want to stop at the ranch gate, that's what. Too god damn lazy to pull up. Wonder he isn't too damn good to stop in Soledad at all. Kicks us out and says, Jess a little stretch down the road. I bet it was more than four miles. Damn hot day. Lenny looked timidly over to him. George? Yeah, what you want? Where we goin', George? The little man jerked down the brim of his hat and scowled over at Lenny. So you forgot that already, did you? I gotta tell you again, do I? Jesus Christ, you're a crazy bastard. I forgot, Lenny said softly. I tried not to forget. Honest to God I did, George. Oh K, OK. I'll tell you again. I ain't got nothing to do. Might just as well spend all my time tellin' you things and then you forget them, and I tell you again. Tried and tried, said Lenny, but it didn't do no good. I remember about the rabbits, George. The hell with the rabbits. That's all you ever can remember is them rabbits. Okay. Now you listen and this time you got to remember so we don't get in no trouble. You remember Settin in that gutter on Howard Street and watchin' that blackboard? Lenny's face broke into a delighted smile. Why sure, George. I remember that, but, what did we do then? I remember some girls come by and you says, you says. The hell with what I says. You remember about us goin' into Murray and Reddy's, and they give us work cards and bus tickets? Oh, sure, George. I remember that now. His hands went quickly into his side coat pockets. He said gently, George. I ain't got mine. I musta lost it. He looked down at the ground in despair. You never had none, you crazy bastard. I got both of em here. Think I'd let you carry your own work card? Lenny grinned with relief. I. I thought I put it in my side pocket. His hand went into the pocket again. George looked sharply at him. What did you take out of that pocket? Ain't a thing in my pocket, Lenny said cleverly. I know there ain't. You got it in your hand. What you got in your hand, hidin' it? I ain't got nothin', George. Honest. Come on, give it here. Lenny held his closed hand away from George's direction. It's Annie a mouse, George. A mouse? A live mouse? Uh uh. Just a dead mouse, George. I didn't kill it. Honest. I found it. I found it dead. Give it here. Said George. Ah, uh, leave me have it, George. Give it here. Lenny's closed hand slowly obeyed. George took the mouse and threw it across the pool to the other side, among the brush. What you want of a dead mouse, anyways? I could pet it with my thumb while we walked along, said Lenny. Well, you ain't petting no mice while you walk with me. You remember where we're going now? Lenny looked startled and then in embarrassment hid his face against his knees. I forgot again. Jesus Christ, George said resignedly. Well, look, we're gonna work on a ranch like the one we come from up north. Up north? In weed. Oh, sure. 
I remember. In weed. That ranch we're going to is right down there about a quarter mile. We're gonna go in and see the boss. Now, look, I'll give him the work tickets, but you ain't gonna say a word. You just stand there and don't say nothing. If he finds out what a crazy bastard you are, we won't get no job, but if he sees your work before he hears you talk, we're set. You got that? Sure, George. Sure I got it. Okay. Now when we go in to see the boss, what you gonna do? I. I. Lenny thought. His face grew tight with thought, I, ain't gonna say nothing. Just gonna stand, there. Good boy. That's swell. You say that over two, three times so you sure won't forget it. Lenny droned to himself softly, I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing, dot. Okay, said George. And you ain't gonna do no bad things like you done in weed, neither. Lenny looked puzzled. Like I done in weed? Again. Oh, so you forgot that too, did ya? Well, I ain't gonna remind ya, fear ya do it a light of understanding broke on Lenny's face. They run us out of weed, he exploded triumphantly. Run us out, hell, said George disgustedly. We run. They was looking for us, but they didn't catch us. Lenny giggled happily. I didn't forget that, you bet. George lay back on the sand and crossed his hands under his head, and Lenny imitated him, raising his head to see whether he was doing it right. God, you're a lot of trouble, said George. I could get along so easy and so nice if I didn't have you on my tail. I could live so easy and maybe have a girl. For a moment Lenny lay quiet, and then he said hopefully, we gonna work on a ranch, George. All right. You got that. But we're gonna sleep here because I got a reason. The day was going fast now. Only the tops of the Gabalon Mountains flamed with the light of the sun that had gone from the valley. A water snake slipped along on the pool, its head held up like a little periscope. The reeds jerked slightly in the current. Far off toward the highway a man shouted something, and another man shouted back. The sycamore limbs rustled under a little wind that died immediately. George, why ain't we goin' on to the ranch and get some supper? They got supper at the ranch. George rolled on his side. No reason at all for you. I like it here. Tomorrow we're gonna go to work. I seen thrashin' machines on the way down. That means we'll be buckin' grain bags, bustin' a gut, tonight I'm gonna lay right here and look up. I like it. Lenny got up on his knees and looked down at George. Ain't we gonna have no supper? Sure we are, if you gather up some dead willow sticks. I got three cans of beans in my bindle. You get a fire ready. I'll give you a match when you get the sticks together. Then we'll heat the beans and have supper. Lenny said, I like beans with ketchup. Well, we ain't got no ketchup. You go get wood. And don't you fool around. It'll be dark before long. Lenny lumbered to his feet and disappeared in the brush. George lay where he was and whistled softly to himself. There were sounds of splashings down the river in the direction Lenny had taken. George stopped whistling and listened. Poor bastard, he said softly, and then went on whistling again. In a moment Lenny came crashing back through the brush. He carried one small willow stick in his hand. George sat up. All right, he said brusquely. G.I. me that mouse. But Lenny made an elaborate pantomime of innocence. What mouse, George? I ain't got no mouse. George held out his hand. Come on. Give it to me. You ain't putting nothing over. Lenny hesitated, backed away, looked wildly at the brush line as though he contemplated running for his freedom. George said coldly, you gonna give me that mouse or do I have to sock you? 
Give you what, George? You know god damn well what. I want that mouse. Lenny reluctantly reached into his pocket. His voice broke a little. I don't know why I can't keep it. It ain't nobody's mouse. I didn't steal it. I found it lying right beside the road. George's hand remained outstretched imperiously. Slowly, like a terrier who doesn't want to bring a ball to its master, Lenny approached, drew back, approached again. George snapped his fingers sharply, and at the sound Lenny laid the mouse in his hand. I wasn't doing nothing bad with it, George. Just stroking it. George stood up and threw the mouse as far as he could into the darkening brush, and then he stepped to the pool and washed his hands. You crazy fool. Don't you think I could see your feet was wet where you went across the river to get it? He heard Lenny's whimpering cry and wheeled about. Blubberin' like a baby. Jesus Christ. A big guy like you. Lenny's lip quivered and tears started in his eyes. Ah, uh, Lenny. George put his hand on Lenny's shoulder. I ain't takin it away just for meanness. That mouse ain't fresh, Lenny, and besides, you've broke it pet tin it. You get another mouse that's fresh and I'll let you keep it a little while. Lenny sat down on the ground and hung his head dejectedly. I don't know where there is no other mouse. I remember a lady used to give M to me, ever one she got. But that lady ain't here. George scoffed. Lady, huh? Don't even remember who that lady was. That was your own Aunt Clara. And, she stopped giving M to ya. You always killed M. Lenny looked sadly up at him. They was so little, he said, apologetically. I'd pet them, and pretty soon they bit my fingers and I pinched their heads a little and then they was dead, because they was so little. I wished we'd get the rabbits pretty soon, George. They ain't so little. The hell with the rabbits. And you ain't to be trusted with no live mice. Your Aunt Clara give you a rubber mouse and you wouldn't have nothing to do with it. It wasn't no good to pet, said Lenny. The flame of the sunset lifted from the mountaintops and dusk came into the valley, and a half-darkness came in among the willows and the sycamores. A big carp rose to the surface of the pool, gulped air and then sank mysteriously into the dark water again, leaving widening rings on the water. Overhead the leaves whisked again and little puffs of willow cotton blew down and landed on the pool's surface. You gonna get that wood? George demanded. There's plenty right up against the back of that sycamore. Floodwater wood. Now you get it. Lenny went behind the tree and brought out a litter of dried leaves and twigs. He threw them in a heap on the old ash pile and went back for more and more. It was almost night now. A dove's wings whistled over the water. George walked to the fire pile and lighted the dry leaves. The flame cracked up among the twigs and fell to work. George undid his bindle and brought out three cans of beans. He stood them about the fire, close in against the blaze, but not quite touching the flame. There's enough beans for four men, George said. Lenny watched him from over the fire. He said patiently, I like M with ketchup. Well, we ain't got any, George exploded. Whatever we ain't got, that's what you want. God a mighty, if I was alone I could live so easy. I could go get a job and work, and no trouble. No mess at all, and when the end of the month come I could take my fifty bucks and go into town and get whatever I want. Why, I could stay in a cat house all night. I could eat any place I want hotel or any place, and order any damn thing I could think of. And, I could do all that every damn month. Get a gallon of whiskey, or set in a pool room and play cards or shoot pool. Lenny knelt and looked over the fire at the angry George. And Lenny's face was drawn with terror. And, wada I got, George went on furiously. I got you. You can't keep a job and you lose me every job I get. 
just keep me shove in all over the country all the time. And that ain't the worst. You get in trouble. You do bad things and I got to get you out. His voice rose nearly to a shout. You crazy son of a bitch. You keep me in hot water all the time. He took on the elaborate manner of little girls when they are mimicking one another. Just wanted to feel that girl's dress, just wanted to pet it like it was a mouse, well, how the hell did she know you just wanted to feel her dress? She jerks back and you hold on like it was a mouse. She yells and we got to hide in a irrigation ditch all day with guys looking for us, and we got to sneak out in the dark and get out of the country. All the time something like that all the time. I wished I could put you in a cage with about a million mice and let you have fun. His anger left him suddenly. He looked across the fire at Lenny's anguished face, and then he looked ashamedly at the flames. It was quite dark now, but the fire lighted the trunks of the trees and the curving branches overhead. Lenny crawled slowly and cautiously around the fire until he was close to George. He sat back on his heels. George turned the bean can so that another side faced the fire. He pretended to be unaware of Lenny so close beside him. George, very softly. No answer. George. What do you want? I was only foolin', George. I don't want no ketchup. I wouldn't eat no ketchup if it was right here beside me. If it was here, you could have some. But I wouldn't eat none, George. I'd leave it all for you. You could cover your beans with it and I wouldn't touch none of it. George still stared morosely at the fire. When I think of the swell time I could have without you, I go nuts. I never get no peace. Lenny still knelt. He looked off into the darkness across the river. George, you want I should go away and leave you alone? Where the hell could you go? Well, I could. I could go off in the hills there. Some place I'd find a cave. Yeah. How'd you eat? You ain't got sense enough to find nothing to eat. I'd find things, George. I don't need no nice food with ketchup. I'd lay out in the sun and nobody'd hurt me. And if I found a mouse, I could keep it. Nobody'd take it away from me. George looked quickly and searchingly at him. I been mean, ain't I? If you don want me I can go off in the hills and find a cave. I can go away any time. No, look. I was just foolin', Lenny. Cause I want you to stay with me. Trouble with mice is you always kill them. He paused. Tell you what I'll do, Lenny. First chance I get I'll give you a pup. Maybe you wouldn't kill it. That'd be better than mice. And you could pet it harder. Lenny avoided the bait. He had sensed his advantage. If you don't want me, you only just got to say so, and I'll go off in those hills right there, right up in those hills and live by myself. And I won't get no mice stole from me. George said, I want you to stay with me, Lenny. Jesus Christ, somebody'd shoot you for a coyote if you was by yourself. No, you stay with me. Your Aunt Clara wouldn't like you running off by yourself, even if she is dead. Lenny spoke craftily, tell me, like you done before. Tell you what? About the rabbits. George snapped, you ain't gonna put nothing over on me. Lenny pleaded, come on, George. Tell me. Please, George. Like you done before. You get a kick out of that, don't you? Alright, I'll tell you, and then we'll eat our supper. George's voice became deeper. He repeated his words rhythmically as though he had said them many times before. Guys like us, that work on ranches, are the loneliest guys in the world. They got no family. They don't belong no place. They come to a ranch and work up a stake and then they go into town and blow their stake, and the first thing you know they're poundin', their tail on some other ranch. They ain't got nothing to look ahead to. 
Lenny was delighted. That's it, that's it. Now tell how it is with us. George went on. With us it ain't like that. We got a future. We got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us. We don't have to sit in no bar room blowin' in our jack just because we got no place else to go. If them other guys gets in jail they can rot for all anybody gives a damn. But not us. Lenny broke in. But not us. And why? Because because I got you to look after me, and you got me to look after you, and that's why. He laughed delightedly. Go on now, George. You got it by heart. You can do it yourself. No, you. I forget some of the things. Tell about how it's gonna be. Okay someday, we're gonna get the jack together and we're gonna have a little house and a couple of acres and a cow and some pigs and dash and live off the fat of the lawn, Lenny shouted. And have rabbits. Go on, George. Tell about what we're gonna have in the garden and about the rabbits in the cages and about the rain in the winter and the stove, and how thick the cream is on the milk like you can hardly cut it. Tell about that, George. Why ain't you do it yourself? You know all of it. No. You tell it. It ain't the same if I tell it. Go on. George. How I get to tend the rabbits. Well, said George, we'll have a big vegetable patch and a rabbit hutch and chickens. And when it rains in the winter, we'll just say the hell with going to work and we'll build up a fire in the stove and set around it and listen to the rain coming down on the roof, nuts. He took out his pocket knife. I ain't got time for no more. He drove his knife through the top of one of the bean cans, sought out the top and passed the can to Lenny. Then he opened a second can. From his side pocket he brought out two spoons and passed one of them to Lenny. They sat by the fire and filled their mouths with beans and chewed mightily. A few beans slipped out of the side of Lenny's mouth. George gestured with his spoon. What you gonna say tomorrow when the boss asks you questions? Lenny stopped chewing and swallowed. His face was concentrated. I. I ain't gonna, say a word. Good boy. That's fine, Lenny. Maybe you're getting better. When we get the Kupla acres I can let you tend the rabbits all right. Especially if you remember as good as that. Lenny choked with pride. I can remember, he said. George motioned with his spoon again. Look, Lenny. I want you to look around here. You can remember this place, can't you? The ranch is about a quarter mile up that way. Just follow the river? Sure said Lenny. I can remember this. Dn't I remember about not gonna say a word? Course you did. Well, look. Lenny, if you just happen to get in trouble like you always done before, I want you to come right here and hide in the brush. Hide in the brush, said Lenny slowly. Hide in the brush till I come for you. Can you remember that? Sure I can, George. Hide in the brush till you come. But you ain't gonna get in no trouble, because if you do, I won't let you tend the rabbits. He threw his empty bean can off into the brush. I won't get in no trouble, George. I ain't gonna say a word. Okay bring your bindle over here by the fire. It's gonna be nice sleepin' here. Lookin' up, and the leaves. Don't build up no more fire. We'll let her die down. They made their beds on the sand, and as the blaze dropped from the fire the sphere of light grew smaller, the curling branches disappeared and only a faint glimmer showed where the tree trunks were. From the darkness Lenny called, George, you asleep? No. What do you want? Let's have different color rabbits, George. Sure we will, George said sleepily. Red and blue and green rabbits, Lenny. Millions of, m. Furry ones, George, like I seen in the fair in Sacramento. Sure, furry ones. Cause I can just as well go away, 
George, and live in a cave. You can just as well go to hell, said George. Shut up now. The red light dimmed on the coals. Up the hill from the river a coyote yammered, and a dog answered from the other side of the stream. The sycamore leaves whispered in a little night breeze. Chapter 2 The bunkhouse was a long, rectangular building. Inside, the walls were whitewashed and the floor unpainted. In three walls there were small, square windows, and in the fourth, a solid door with a wooden latch. Against the walls were eight bunks, five of them made up with blankets and the other three showing their burlap ticking. Over each bunk there was nailed an apple box with the opening forward so that it made two shelves for the personal belongings of the occupant of the bunk. And these shelves were loaded with little articles, soap and talcum powder, razors and those western magazines ranch men love to read and scoff at and secretly believe. And there were medicines on the shelves, and little vials, combs, and from nails on the box sides, a few neckties. Near one wall there was a black cast iron stove, its stovepipe going straight up through the ceiling. In the middle of the room stood a big square table littered with playing cards, and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. At about ten o'clock in the morning the sun threw a bright dust-laden bar through one of the side windows, and in and out of the beam flies shot like rushing stars. The wooden latch raised. The door opened and a tall, stoop-shouldered old man came in. He was dressed in blue jeans and he carried a big push broom in his left hand. Behind him came George, and behind George, Lenny. The boss was expectin' you last night, the old man said. He was sore as hell when you wasn't here to go out this morning. He pointed with his right arm, and out of the sleeve came a round stick-like wrist, but no hand. You can have them two beds there, he said, indicating two bunks near the stove. George stepped over and threw his blankets down on the burlap sack of straw that was a mattress. He looked into his box shelf and then picked a small yellow can from it. Say. What the hell's this? I don't know, said the old man. Says, positively kills lice, roaches and other scourges. What the hell kind of bed you giving us, anyways? We don't want no pants rabbits. The old swamper shifted his broom and held it between his elbow and his side while he held out his hand for the can. He studied the label carefully. Tell you what dash, he said finally, last guy that had this bed was a blacksmith, hell of a nice fella and as clean a guy as you want to meet. Used to wash his hands even after he ate. Then how come he got graybacks? George was working up a slow anger. Lenny put his bindle on the neighboring bunk and sat down. He watched George with open mouth. Tell you what, said the old swamper. This here blacksmith, name of Whitey, was the kind of guy that would put that stuff around even if there wasn't no bugs, just to make sure, see? Tell you what he used to do, at meals he'd peel his boil, potatoes, and he'd take out ever little spot, no matter what kind, before he'd eat it. And if there was a red splotch on an egg, he'd scrape it off. Finally quit about the food. That's the kind of guy he was, clean. Used to dress up Sundays even when he wasn't going no place, put on a necktie even, and then sat in the bunkhouse. I ain't so sure, said George skeptically. What did you say he quit for? The old man put the yellow can in his pocket, and he rubbed his bristly white whiskers with his knuckles. Why, he, just quit, the way a guy will. Says it was the food. Just wanted to move. Didn't give no other reason but the food. Just says, gimme my time one night, the way any guy would. George lifted his tick and looked underneath it. He leaned over and inspected the sacking closely. Immediately Lenny got up and did the same with his bed. Finally George seemed satisfied. He unrolled his bindle and put things on the shelf, his razor and bar of soap, his comb and bottle of pills, his liniment and leather wristband. Then he made his bed up neatly with blankets. The old man said, I guess the boss'll be out here in a minute. 
He was sure burned when you wasn't here this morning. Come right in when we was eaten breakfast and says, where the hell's them new men? And, he give the stable buck hell, too. George patted a wrinkle out of his bed, and sat down. Give the stable buck hell, he asked. Sure. You see the stable buck's a nigger. Nigger, huh? Yeah. Nice fella too. Got a crooked back where a horse kicked him. The boss gives him hell when he's mad. But the stable buck don't give a damn about that. He reads a lot. Got books in his room. What kind of a guy is the boss? George asked. Well, he's a pretty nice fella. Gets pretty mad sometimes, but he's pretty nice. Tell ya what, know what he done Christmas. Bring a gallon of whiskey right in here and says, drink hearty, boys. Christmas comes but once a year. The hell he did. Whole gallon? Yes sir. Jesus, we had fun. They let the nigger come in that night. Little Skinner name of Smitty took after the nigger. Done pretty good, too. The guys wouldn't let him use his feet, so the nigger got him. If he coulda used his feet, Smitty says he woulda killed the nigger. The guys said on account of the nigger's got a crooked back, Smitty can't use his feet. He paused in relish of the memory. After that the guys went into Soledad and raised hell. I didn't go in there. I ain't got the poop no more. Lenny was just finishing making his bed. The wooden latch raised again and the door opened. A little stocky man stood in the open doorway. He wore blue jean trousers, a flannel shirt, a black, unbuttoned vest and a black coat. His thumbs were stuck in his belt, on each side of a square steel buckle. On his head was a soiled brown Stetson hat, and he wore high-heeled boots and spurs to prove he was not a laboring man. The old swamper looked quickly at him, and then shuffled to the door rubbing his whiskers with his knuckles as he went. Them guys just come, he said, and shuffled past the boss and out the door. The boss stepped into the room with the short, quick steps of a fat-legged man. I wrote Murray and Reddy I wanted two men this morning. You got your work slips? George reached into his pocket and produced the slips and handed them to the boss. It wasn't Murray and Reddy's fault. Says right here on the slip that you was to be here for work this morning. George looked down at his feet. Bus driver give us a bum steer, he said. We had a walk ten miles. Says we was here when we wasn't. We couldn't get no rides in the morning. The boss squinted his eyes. Well, I had to send out the grain team's short two buckers. Won't do any good to go out now till after dinner. He pulled his time book out of his pocket and opened it where a pencil was stuck between the leaves. George scowled meaningfully at Lenny, and Lenny nodded to show that he understood. The boss licked his pencil. What's your name? George Milton. And what's yours? George said, his name's Lenny Small. The names were entered in the book. Lee C., this is the 20th, noon the 20th. He closed the book. Where you boys been working? Up around Weed, said George. You, too, to Lenny. Yeah, him too, said George. The boss pointed a playful finger at Lenny. He ain't much of a talker, is he? No, he ain't, but he's sure a hell of a good worker. Strong as a bull. Lenny smiled to himself. Strong as a bull, he repeated. George scowled at him, and Lenny dropped his head in shame at having forgotten. The boss said suddenly, listen, small. Lenny raised his head. What can you do? In a panic, Lenny looked at George for help. He can do anything you tell him, said George. He's a good skinner. He can wrestle grain bags, drive a cultivator. He can do anything. Just give him a try. The boss turned on George. Then why don't you let him answer? What you trying to put over? George broke in loudly, oh. 
I ain't saying he's bright. He ain't. But I say he's a goddamn good worker. He can put up a 400 pound bale. The boss deliberately put the little book in his pocket. He hooked his thumbs in his belt and squinted one eye nearly closed. Say, what you sellin'? Huh? I said what stake you got in this guy? You talking his pay away from him? No, course I ain't. Why you think I'm sellin' him out? Well, I never seen one guy take so much trouble for another guy. I just like to know what your interest is. George said, he's my, cousin. I told his old lady I'd take care of him. He got kicked in the head by a horse when he was a kid. He's a right. Just ain't bright. But he can do anything you tell him. The boss turned half away. Well, God knows he don't need any brains to buck barley bags. But don't you try to put nothing over, Milton. I got my eye on you. Why'd you quit in weed? Job was done, said George promptly. What kind of job? We, we was diggin' a cesspool. All right. But don't try to put nothing over, cause you can't get away with nothing. I seen wise guys before. Go on out with the grain teams after dinner. They're pickin' up barley at the threshing machine. Go out with Slim's team. Slim? Yeah. Big tall Skinner. You'll see him at dinner. He turned abruptly and went to the door, but before he went out he turned and looked for a long moment at the two men. When the sound of his footsteps had died away, George turned on Lenny. So you wasn't gonna say a word. You was gonna leave your big flapper shut and leave me do the talkin'. Damn near lost us the job. Lenny stared hopelessly at his hands. I forgot, George. Yeah, you forgot. You always forget, and I got to talk you out of it. He sat down heavily on the bunk. Now he's got his eye on us. Now we got to be careful and not make no slips. You keep your big flapper shut after this. He fell morosely silent. George. What you want now? I wasn't kicked in the head with no horse, was I, George? Be a damn good thing if you was, George said viciously. Save everybody a hell of a lot of trouble. You said I was your cousin, George. Well, that was a lie. And I'm damn glad it was. If I was a relative of yours I'd shoot myself. He stopped suddenly, stepped to the open front door and peered out. Say, what the hell you doin' listenin'? The old man came slowly into the room. He had his broom in his hand. And at his heels there walked a drag-footed sheepdog, gray of muzzle, and with pale, blind old eyes. The dog struggled lamely to the side of the room and lay down, grunting softly to himself and licking his grizzled, moth-eaten coat. The swamper watched him until he was settled. I wasn't listenin'. I was just standin' in the shade a minute scratchin' my dog. I just now finished swampin' out the wash house. You was pokin' your big ears into our business, George said. I don't like nobody to get nosy. The old man looked uneasily from George to Lenny, and then back. I just come there, he said. I didn't hear nothing you guys was sayin'. I ain't interested in nothing you was sayin'. A guy on a ranch don't never listen nor he don't ast no questions. Damn right he don't, said George, slightly mollified, not if he wants to stay working long. But he was reassured by the swamper's defense. Come on in and set down a minute, he said. That's a hell of an old dog. Yeah. I had him ever since he was a pup. God, he was a good sheep dog when he was younger. He stood his broom against the wall and he rubbed his white bristled cheek with his knuckles. How do you like the boss? he asked. Pretty good. Seemed a right. He's a nice fella, the swamper agreed. You got to take him right. At that moment a young man came into the bunkhouse, 
a thin young man with a brown face, with brown eyes and a head of tightly curled hair. He wore a work glove on his left hand, and, like the boss, he wore high-heeled boots. Seen my old man? he asked. The swamper said, he was here just a minute ago, Curly. Went over to the cook house, I think. I'll try to catch him, said Curly. His eyes passed over the new men and he stopped. He glanced coldly at George and then at Lenny. His arms gradually bent at the elbows and his hands closed into fists. He stiffened and went into a slight crouch. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. Lenny squirmed under the look and shifted his feet nervously. Curly stepped gingerly close to him. You the new guys the old man was waiting for. We just come in, said George. Let the big guy talk. Lenny twisted with embarrassment. George said, "Spose he don't want to talk. Curly lashed his body around. By Christ, he's gotta talk when he's spoke to. What the hell are you getting into it for? We travel together, said George coldly. Oh, so it's that way. George was tense, and motionless. Yeah, it's that way. Lenny was looking helplessly to George for instruction. And you won't let the big guy talk, is that it? He can talk if he wants to tell you anything. He nodded slightly to Lenny. We just come in, said Lenny softly. Curly stared levelly at him. Well, next time you answer when you're spoke to. He turned toward the door and walked out, and his elbows were still bent out a little. George watched him out, and then he turned back to the swamper. Say, what the hell's he got on his shoulder? Lenny didn't do nothing to him. The old man looked cautiously at the door to make sure no one was listening. That's the boss's son, he said quietly. Curly's pretty handy. He done quite a bit in the ring. He's a lightweight, and he's handy. Well, let him be handy, said George. He don't have to take after Lenny. Lenny didn't do nothing to him. What's he got against Lenny? The swamper considered. Well, tell you what. Curly's like a lot of little guys. He hates big guys. He's all the time picking scraps with big guys. Kind of like he's mad at them because he ain't a big guy. You seen little guys like that, ain't you? Always scrappy. Sure, said George. I seen plenty tough little guys. But this Curly better not make no mistakes about Lenny. Lenny ain't handy, but this Curly punk is gonna get hurt if he messes around with Lenny. Well, Curly's pretty handy, the swamper said skeptically. Never did seem right to me. Spose Curly jumps a big guy and licks him. Everybody says what a game guy Curly is. And I suppose he does the same thing and gets licked. Then everybody says the big guy ought to pick somebody his own size, and maybe they gang up on the big guy. Never did seem right to me. Seems like Curly ain't given nobody a chance. George was watching the door. He said ominously, well, he better watch out for Lenny. Lenny ain't no fighter, but Lenny's strong and quick and Lenny don't know no rules. He walked to the square table and sat down on one of the boxes. He gathered some of the cards together and shuffled them. The old man sat down on another box. Don't tell Curly I said none of this. He'd slough me. He just don't give a damn. Won't ever get canned cause his old man's the boss. George cut the cards and began turning them over, looking at each one and throwing it down on a pile. He said, this guy Curly sounds like a son of a bitch to me. I don't like mean little guys. Seems to me like he's worse lately, said the swamper. He got married a couple of weeks ago. Wife lives over in the boss's house. Seems like Curly is cockier than ever since he got married. George grunted, maybe he's showing off for his wife. The swamper warmed to his gossip. You seen that glove on his left hand? Yeah. I seen it. 
Well, that glove's full of Vaseline. Vaseline? What the hell for? Well, I tell ya what, Curly says he's keepin' that hand soft for his wife. George studied the cards absorbedly. That's a dirty thing to tell around, he said. The old man was reassured. He had drawn a derogatory statement from George. He felt safe now, and he spoke more confidently. Wait till you see Curly's wife. George cut the cards again and put out a solitaire lay, slowly and deliberately. Putty? he asked casually. Yeah. Putty, but dash, George studied his cards. But what? Well, she got the eye. Yeah. Married two weeks and got the eye. Maybe that's why Curly's pants is full of ants. I seen her give Slim the eye. Slim's a jerkline skinner. Hell of a nice fella. Slim don't need to wear no high-heeled boots on a grain team. I seen her give Slim the eye. Curly never seen it. And I seen her give Carlson the eye. George pretended a lack of interest. Looks like we was gonna have fun. The swamper stood up from his box. Know what I think? George did not answer. Well, I think Curly's married, a tart. He ain't the first, said George. There's plenty done that. The old man moved toward the door, and his ancient dog lifted his head and peered about, and then got painfully to his feet to follow. I gotta be set tin out the wash basins for the guys. The teams'll be in before long. You guys gonna buck barley? Yeah. You won't tell Curly nothing I said? Hell no. Well, you look her over, mister. You see if she ain't a tart. He stepped out the door into the brilliant sunshine. George laid down his cards thoughtfully, turned his piles of three. He built four clubs on his ace pile. The sun square was on the floor now, and the flies whipped through it like sparks. A sound of jingling harness and the croak of heavy-laden axles sounded from outside. From the distance came a clear call. Stable buck, ooh, stable buck. And then, where the hell is that goddamn nigger? George stared at his solitaire lay, and then he flounced the cards together and turned around to Lenny. Lenny was lying down on the bunk watching him. Look, Lenny. This here ain't no setup. I'm scared. You gonna have trouble with that curly guy. I seen that kind before. He was kinda feelin' you out. He figures he's got you scared and he's gonna take a sock at you the first chance he gets. Lenny's eyes were frightened. I don't want no trouble, he said plaintively. Don't let him sock me, George. George got up and went over to Lenny's bunk and sat down on it. I hate that kinda bastard he said. I seen plenty of, em. Like the old guy says, Curly don't take no chances. He always wins. He thought for a moment. If he tangles with you, Lenny, we're gonna get the can. Don't make no mistake about that. He's the boss's son. Look, Lenny. You try to keep away from him, will you? Don't never speak to him. If he comes in here you move clear to the other side of the room. Will you do that, Lenny? I don't want no trouble, Lenny mourned. I never done nothing to him. Well, that won't do you no good if Curly wants to plug himself up for a fighter. Just don't have nothing to do with him. Will you remember? Sure, George. I ain't gonna say a word. The sound of the approaching grain teams was louder, Thud of big hooves on hard ground, drag of brakes and the jingle of trace chains. Men were calling back and forth from the teams. George, sitting on the bunk beside Lenny, frowned as he thought. Lenny asked timidly, you ain't mad, George? I ain't mad at you. I'm mad at this here curly bastard. I hoped we was gonna get a little stake together, maybe a hundred dollars. His tone grew decisive. You keep away from Curly, Lenny. Sure I will, George. 
I won't say a word. Don't let him pull you in, but, if the son of a bitch socks you, let him have it. Let him have what, George? Never mind, never mind. I'll tell you when. I hate that kind of a guy. Look, Lenny, if you get in any kind of trouble, you remember what I told you to do? Lenny raised up on his elbow. His face contorted with thought. Then his eyes moved sadly to George's face. If I get in any trouble, you ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. That's not what I meant. You remember where we slept last night? Down by the river? Yeah. I remember. Oh, sure I remember. I go there and hide in the brush. Hide till I come for you. Don't let nobody see you. Hide in the brush by the river. Say that over. Hide in the brush by the river, down in the brush by the river. If you get in trouble. If I get in trouble. A brake screeched outside. A call came, stable, buck. Oh. Stable buck. George said, say it over to yourself, Lenny, so you won't forget it. Both men glanced up, for the rectangle of sunshine in the doorway was cut off. A girl was standing there looking in. She had full, rouged lips and wide-spaced eyes, heavily made up. Her fingernails were red. Her hair hung in little rolled clusters, like sausages. She wore a cotton house dress and red mules, on the insteps of which were little bouquets of red ostrich feathers. I'm looking for Curly, she said. Her voice had a nasal, brittle quality. George looked away from her and then back. He was in here a minute ago, but he went. Oh. She put her hands behind her back and leaned against the door frame so that her body was thrown forward. You're the new fellas that just come, ain't ya? Yeah. Lenny's eyes moved down over her body, and though she did not seem to be looking at Lenny she bridled a little. She looked at her fingernails. Sometimes Curly's in here, she explained. George said brusquely. Well he ain't now. If he ain't, I guess I better look someplace else, she said playfully. Lenny watched her, fascinated. George said, if I see him, I'll pass the word you was looking for him. She smiled archly and twitched her body. Nobody can't blame a person for looking, she said. There were footsteps behind her, going by. She turned her head. Hi, Slim, she said. Slim's voice came through the door. Hi, good looking, Dot. I'm trying to find Curly, Slim. Well, you ain't trying very hard. I seen him going in your house. She was suddenly apprehensive. Bye, boys, she called into the bunkhouse, and she hurried away. George looked around at Lenny. Jesus, what a tramp, he said. So that's what Curly picks for a wife. She's putty, said Lenny defensively. Yeah, and she's sure hiding it. Curly got his work ahead of him. Bet she'd clear out for twenty bucks. Lenny still stared at the doorway where she had been. Gosh, she was putty. He smiled admiringly. George looked quickly down at him and then he took him by an ear and shook him. Listen to me, you crazy bastard, he said fiercely. Don't you even take a look at that bitch. I don't care what she says and what she does. I seen M poison before, but I never seen no piece of jail bait worse than her. You leave her be. Lenny tried to disengage his ear. I never done nothing, George. No, you never. But when she was standin' in the doorway showin' her legs, you wasn't lookin' the other way, neither. I never meant no harm, George. Honest I never. Well, you keep away from her, cause she's a rat trap if I ever seen one. You let Curly take the rap. He let himself in for it. Glove full of Vaseline, George said disgustedly. And I bet he's eaten raw eggs and written to the patent medicine houses. Lenny cried out suddenly, I don't like this place, 
George. This ain't no good place. I wanna get outta here. We gotta keep it till we get a stake. We can't help it, Lenny. We'll get out just as soon as we can. I don't like it no better than you do. He went back to the table and set out a new solitaire hand. No, I don't like it, he said. For two bits I'd shove out of here. If we can get just a few dollars in the poke we'll shove off and go up the American River and pan gold. We can make maybe a couple of dollars a day there, and we might hit a pocket. Lenny leaned eagerly toward him. Lee's go, George. Lee's get out of here. It's mean here. We gotta stay, George said shortly. Shut up now. The guys'll be comin' in. From the washroom nearby came the sound of running water and rattling basins. George studied the cards. Maybe we ought to wash up, he said. But we ain't done nothing to get dirty. A tall man stood in the doorway. He held a crushed Stetson hat under his arm while he combed his long, black, damp hair straight back. Like the others he wore blue jeans and a short denim jacket. When he had finished combing his hair he moved into the room, and he moved with a majesty achieved only by royalty and master craftsmen. He was a jerkline skinner, the prince of the ranch, capable of driving ten, sixteen, even twenty mules with a single line to the leaders. He was capable of killing a fly on the wheelers but with a bull whip without touching the mule. There was a gravity in his manner and a quiet so profound that all talk stopped when he spoke. His authority was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. This was Slim, the jerkline Skinner. His hatchet face was ageless. He might have been thirty-five or fifty. His ear heard more than was said to him, and his slow speech had overtones not of thought, but of understanding beyond thought. His hands, large and lean, were as delicate in their action as those of a temple dancer. He smoothed out his crushed hat, creased it in the middle and put it on. He looked kindly at the two in the bunkhouse. It's brighter and a bitch outside, he said gently. Can't hardly see nothing in here. You the new guys? Just come, said George. Gonna buck barley? That's what the boss says. Slim sat down on a box across the table from George. He studied the solitaire hand that was upside down to him. Hope you get on my team, he said. His voice was very gentle. I got a pair of punks on my team that don't know a barley bag from a blue ball. You guys ever bucked any barley? Hell, yes, said George. I ain't nothing to scream about, but that big bastard there can put up more grain alone than most pears can. Lenny, who had been following the conversation back and forth with his eyes, smiled complacently at the compliment. Slim looked approvingly at George for having given the compliment. He leaned over the table and snapped the corner of a loose card. You guys travel around together? His tone was friendly. It invited confidence without demanding it. Sure, said George. We kinda look after each other. He indicated Lenny with his thumb. He ain't bright. Hell of a good worker, though. Hell of a nice fella, but he ain't bright. I've knew him for a long time. Slim looked through George and beyond him. Ain't many guys travel around together, he mused. I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. It's a lot nicer to go around with a guy you know, said George. A powerful, big-stomached man came into the bunkhouse. His head still dripped water from the scrubbing and dousing. Hi, Slim, he said, and then stopped and stared at George and Lenny. These guys just come, said Slim by way of introduction. Glad to meet ya, the big man said. My name's Carlson. I'm George Milton. This here's Lenny Small. Glad to meet ya, Carlson said again. He ain't very small. He chuckled softly at his joke. Ain't small at all, he repeated. 
Meant to ask you, Slim, how's your bitch? I seen she wasn't under your wagon this morning. She slang her pups last night, said Slim. Nine of M. I drowned four of M right off. She couldn't feed that many. Got five left, huh? Yeah, five. I kept the biggest. What kind of dogs you think they're gonna be? I dunno, said Slim. Some kind of shepherds, I guess. That's the most kind I seen around here when she was in heat. Carlson went on, got five pups, huh? Gonna keep all of them? I dunno. Have to keep em a while so they can drink Lulu's milk. Carlson said thoughtfully, well, loca here, slim. I been thinking. That dog of candies is so goddamn old he can't hardly walk stinks like hell, too. Ever time he comes into the bunkhouse I can smell him for two, three days. Why ain't you get candy to shoot his old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up? I can smell that dog a mile away. Got no teeth, damn near blind, can't eat. Candy feeds him milk. He can't chew nothing else. George had been staring intently at Slim. Suddenly a triangle began to ring outside, slowly at first, and then faster and faster until the beat of it disappeared into one ringing sound. It stopped as suddenly as it had started. There she goes, said Carlson. Outside, there was a burst of voices as a group of men went by. Slim stood up slowly and with dignity. You guys better come on while they still something to eat. Won't be nothing left in a couple of minutes. Carlson stepped back to let Slim precede him, and then the two of them went out the door. Lenny was watching George excitedly. George rumpled his cards into a messy pile. Yeah. George said, I heard him, Lenny. I'll ask him. A brown and white one, Lenny cried excitedly. Come on. Please get dinner. I don't know whether he got a brown and white one. Lenny didn't move from his bunk. You ask him right away, George, so he won't kill no more of them. Sure. Come on now, get up on your feet. Lenny rolled off his bunk and stood up, and the two of them started for the door. Just as they reached it, Curly bounced in. You seen a girl around here, he demanded angrily. George said coldly. About half an hour ago maybe. Well what the hell was she doing? George stood still, watching the angry little man. He said insultingly, she said, she was looking for you. Curly seemed really to see George for the first time. His eyes flashed over George, took in his height, measured his reach, looked at his trim middle. Well, which way'd she go? he demanded at last. I dunno, said George. I didn't watch her go. Curly scowled at him, and turning, hurried out the door. George said, you know, Lenny, I'm scared I'm gonna tangle with that bastard myself. I hate his guts. Jesus Christ. Come on. They won't be a damn thing left to eat. They went out the door. The sunshine lay in a thin line under the window. From a distance there could be heard a rattle of dishes. After a moment the ancient dog walked lamely in through the open door. He gazed about with mild, half-blind eyes. He sniffed, and then lay down and put his head between his paws. Curly popped into the doorway again and stood looking into the room. The dog raised his head, but when Curly jerked out, the grizzled head sank to the floor again.